Hello? Ooh, 315, you guys ready to start? Oh, I, I, can, I can warm this crowd up. I can tell you guys are eager to talk about continuous integration. Uh, welcome, welcome to 2018 reInvent Conference. Um, Tuesday, I know you guys have already been to many conferences and many speaker talks, but thank you for coming to this one. I think it will be a good one. Um, I'm very excited to be giving this talk, and with me today I have Joe Fusich, who is a senior developer, and we're gonna be giving the talk together. Um, Joe's really gonna help me right at the end. We're gonna do a live demo, which is always dicey, especially with the Wi-Fi. How's the Wi-Fi for everybody here? Yeah, it's okay. I'm hoping it stays throughout the, throughout the talk. Um, so we're gonna talk about continuous integration today. We're gonna do a little live demo. At the end, we'll take some questions at the end, if we have time, um, probably in the corner. Now, before I get going, a little, a little uh, room recognition. Who is using continuous integration today? Why are you guys here? That's great. That's great. Who, I should see binary here. Who's not using continuous integration today? All right. And how about those of you who'd like to use it better? Oh, good. I like that. I like that. All right. So we're going to be talking about continuous integration. We're going to be talking about the tooling. And so for those of you who have already uh, dived into CI, you know, some of this might be a repeat, but um, bear with us. And then we'll be talking about some best practices, which I think everyone will gain something out of. And then finally, uh, Joseph and I will be doing the demo, last uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll do a very, very quick review. Now, um, this has been a repeat, and I believe it will be, uh, like all the breakouts will be put up on YouTube, so if you uh, wanna share it with your colleagues or what have you, feel free to do so. Um, however, there are some other related talks that you might find interesting. So we're gonna be talking about CI, continuous integration, uh, but there's also CI, CD. That's really the most common uh, term when we talk about this, this methodology. And CI, CD is really a whole pipeline of tools and practices. And we'll be, again, focusing on the first part of it. But if you wanna get into that CD portion, feel free to, um, uh, if you have time, I think actually these are all finished, except for the last one. Uh, but you can look them up and we talk about CI, CD for, for serverless, for containers. I talked to some er people earlier, they're really getting into containers. Um, and also Thursday, if you haven't um, signed up for it, we have a new um, item to the agenda where well, we're gonna be doing a leadership session with the GM of our, of our team who will be talking about uh, serverless and DevOps and microservices. And I think that's very exciting because CI, CD is really tooling um, to, to solve a particular problem, but it really fits within the overall arch of of DevOps, and that's really something that has um, been around for about 10 years, but in the last two or three has really taken the development world by storm and has really improved the quality of software um, that is developed and published. All right, so you know, what is continuous integration? Um, I think everyone knows, everyone's here, but let's just level set. It's really about developing and pushing to a centralized repository, your software team, your developers, uh, multiple times a day. Um, how often is multiple times a day? It's vague, but you should be able to do it at least 10 times a day. The idea is you can't do it manually. You need to get to the point where you have to automate the process. When you get to automate the process, you work on those difficult edges, you sand it down, it becomes easier and easier, become second nature. The other part of it which is important and often we looked over by frankly even sophisticated uh, development teams is that you really have to have the tests. I mean you don't have to have the tests but we all know that unit tests, integration tests are important and not only that, people are getting more and more sophisticated. I have customers who are doing security analysis tests, static analysis tests, uh, they're doing performance tests. They're doing more and more complicated tests during their build cycle to make sure that the code is not only uh, solid and works, but it's secure and it runs faster than any, the previous builds. So if there's some sort of weird bug in there, it gets found during that testing. A more modern definition might be simply that CI builds artifacts. And that's because it doesn't always have to be software, that's what we're gonna be talking about today, but these tooling is extensible, it's very flexible and very general. And you can use it really for all sorts of things. For example, one of the slides we'll be talking about is simply maintenance. CI can be part of your maintenance cycle where you update your libraries. Or you can do things of that nature. And it really, I'm not building code, but I am maintaining my code. I have customers who use CI to process to uh, tag, right? 
Uh, we're going to talk about Git quite a bit today. And when you commit, you have various options. You know, you can tag a release, you can, you can create branches, you can do all sorts of really cool things with Git. Um, but sometimes people forget, you know, to do the best practices. So you can automate that as well. All right, so when we get down to it, what are we really talking about? We're talking about this, this cycle, and this cycle is very similar to most DevOps cycles when you get down to it. It really is a microcosm of, of DevOps. Um, so developers are gonna regularly check in code, and, and this is important to a shared central repository. I mean, I think that goes without saying, but um, it has to, be, uh, has to be shared and central. Now, we're gonna be talking about Git today. Who, who is using Git? Hey, that's pretty good. I did a talk the other day, and we had a, lot, a couple of holdouts. Anyone using Subversion here? I got, a, I got one, always one guy using Subversion. That's, that's okay. Um, we are gonna be talking primarily about Git for the shared central repository, because Git has taken the world by storm. Uh, it was the, it's open source, it's powerful, it's lightweight, uh, very much like Amazon, very, very extensible. Um, anyone know the history? Where did, who, who created Git? Right, all right, it was developed simply for the Linux source code repository. And because it's, it's such a big repository and has so many committers, um, it really became a great tool for, for really all development teams. All right, so we're checking in very often, you know, up to 10 times a day, whether we do that or not is up to our teams. Once those, uh, those commits happen, we're triggering an automated build that will compile the code, or if you're using more modern, uh, you know, languages like Python or Node, maybe we're simply doing some sort of check on the code base. But this is the, the build and test cycle. And obviously the next port that is uh, critical is in the feedback loop is that developers get immediate feedback. The quicker the better, right? Who doesn't write software, make a mistake, push it in, and if you don't get that feedback, you just keep going. And obviously we're human, we make mistakes, and you know, 15 seconds later I get the notice, oh, bad build, I'll go back and I'll, oh, what did I do? But you do need that very rapid feedback loop to make this effective. Now this slide, just to go over some of the Amazon tooling we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about Cloud9, I'm not gonna be talking in any depth about uh, Elastic Container Registry. Uh, which is used for containers and, and Kubernetes and such forth. We are gonna be focusing mostly on code commit and code build, but again, I'm happy to take uh, your questions offline and we can go into it. If people are not familiar with Cloud9, it's a web-based IDE that uh, Amazon uh, AWS supports. Um, and we also are gonna be talking a little bit about um, CloudWatch near the, near the end, because I'm actually in our demo, we're gonna do CI CD, although we're really gonna be talking about CI. Let's see if this little, ah, oh, it works. Excellent, I'm gonna need that later. This is the demo that we're gonna do, but even if it weren't the demo, this is very common. So again, we're gonna be focusing on the left side of this diagram, but your developer, he writes code, laptop, desktop, pushes the code. Once the code is pushed into the repository, we have that build cycle. After the build cycle, we have the test cycle. If possible, you're gonna to wanna to parallelize the tests. This is a, a best practice. If you do it serially, you just lose time. It's not a bad thing, but it is wasteful. That's where we're gonna to stop today. Then you have to push it out into your production, your development, your, your QA, your staging, whatever it is, because developers not only wanna know that the code built, they actually wanna see it, right? They wanna see it working. And again, part of the DevOps is small incremental changes, and you wanna get that immediate feedback as a developer. You wanna see the code working. It gives them satisfaction, and it gives them the ability to test it, right? So we're gonna do, um, after the build, we're gonna actually build a Docker container, which is gonna be pushed into a container registry, which happens to be ECR. Um, and then the container registry is um, immediately gonna kick off a push to a Kubernetes cluster. And Joseph's gonna actually show you uh, how that looks, and if we have time, we can even build, go into the, the particulars, all right? So I've been talking how wonderful it is. Is there a way to sort of validate it? And there is, thankfully. There's been many, many uh, surveys and investigations into software best practices. Software, building software, while still very much an art, has been around for over 50 years, and many fine companies have done some great work on how to build software better. So last year, 2017, there was a DevOps report put out by Puppet. And 
some of the things that they found during that report is that teams that operate in a CI CD model have significantly better code, uh, five times uh, better code. And, and why are we doing that? Why are they getting such better code? It's simply because they're finding the bugs faster. Right? By doing those tests immediately after you're pushing your code, you can see if there's something wrong. I mean, maybe if there's some subtle logic bug in there, you're not gonna see it immediately, but generally you're gonna find all the, the basic issues very much um, early in your development cycle. Because you can do that, you can also deliver faster because of the automation. Now this is a huge number. I mean, I can't really comprehend this number. Hundreds of times faster um, from commit to play. I mean, that's, Impressive, and that's impressive if you're, you know, one guy in a garage, small team, large team. I mean, it really scales. Um, we, we're not going to talk about Amazon's two pizza teams, where we say, you know, they're scaling, but then they're scaling, right? There is a, a limit to the overhead of teams and how large they get. But in general, for any size teams, you're going to get a huge impact, hundreds of times, um, from delivery. And then, as the developer's not worrying about the delivery process, because that's all been smoothed down, they get significantly more time, uh, 44%, almost 50%. It's like, poof, I get you know, an extra day in my week, practically. Huge amounts of time. And actually, some of our teams who have done this, it, they don't always use it to write more code. Sometimes they'll use that extra time to increase their skills and become better developers. That's one thing you can work with your managers, right? Oh, I just saved us so much time. Let me, let me do this and that. Uh, but no, that's something that we do take seriously. Happy developers, right? They are the lifeblood of any company cranking out the software, and you want to keep them sharp. You want to maintain them. You want to keep them happy. And that's an important thing. That, that feedback loop not only improves the quality, but it does keep the development teams happier. And that's a big thing. A little bit of summary um, about teams that operate CI, CD. And you know, no matter how you look at it, this is really a win-win. It's a win for the developers who are writing the code. It's a win, it's a win for the management teams um, and, and, your, and your enterprise. So quick summary of you know, why are we doing this? Um, why operate CI, even if you're a small team or if you're just a large team who, ha who hasn't adopted it yet? Um, by reducing the challenges uh, by making things, this is one of the counterintuitive things of, of DevOps, by doing the hard things often and frequent, you make them less hard, right? It used to be, and I'm old enough when I, I remember this quite clearly, it used to be we had these Merge Fridays, and all the developers, you know, I'm working on my branch, you're working on your branch, and we'd get together, you know, at the end of the week, and we'd sort of, you know, swap branches, so to speak. We would maybe do code reviews, and we'd check things out, and then we'd try to do the merge. And then, you know, invariably, it would lead, lead into the weekend because we wouldn't get it done, because Fridays would, it would just drag on and we'd have problems. And that's because, you know, on Monday, someone made a change that's just blocking everything else. By the time you get to Friday, it's like you gotta ratchet back the week. It's just not fun. So doing this is, is really key. Automation over toil, I think I made that clear. Happy developers, smaller batch sizes for the, the testing and integration. Okay, so let's talk about the tooling. How do we actually do this? What do we use to, to do CI? All right, um, as mentioned, we're gonna be using a Git compatible repository. All right, that's sort of table stakes for today. Um, again, we'll talk about you know, the fellows who are using something older because they can still benefit. But in general, we're gonna be talking about a Git compatible repository. So in AWS world, we have code commit. Um, it is a private repo. I'm gonna talk about it in greater detail. Uh, private repo that lives in your account. Um, for the other Amazon tools, they expect a Git compatible repo and we do support things like GitHub, probably the most popular one out there, uh, GitHub Enterprise, Elastian, Bitbucket, and again, for people who are not using some of these major uh, tools um, by the other vendors, as long as you can create an artifact that you can push into S3, that's enough, okay? S3 is very easy to work with, um, and if you can get your, your code into that S3 bucket, we're okay, we can, use, we can use it and work with it. So once we get the code from wherever it is, some Git compatible repo, um, we build it, and we build it and test it, and we're gonna use CodeBuild, very imaginative name, 
it does the builds. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail. So now, one thing I do wanna mention that we're talking about tooling, Jenkins is extremely popular. It is the most popular open source build uh, pipeline tool out there. Who uses Jenkins? Who doesn't wanna use Jenkins? Right? <laughs> no. Jenkins, everyone has a love-hate relationship with Jenkins. It's very mature, it's been around 20 years, it has a million plugins, and it makes it very powerful. So if you are using Jenkins and you're very happy with Jenkins, you continue to use Jenkins, and you can use Jenkins with code build because Jenkins has the ability to have what they call slaves to build, uh, to do the actual builds. And those slaves can be code built. And that's a, a great way of not managing a large Jenkins farm, which can be very challenging as it gets bigger and bigger. So that is a very popular way of using code build as well. All right, so how do we glue these different components together? The repo that talks to the build farm, which talks to you know, the uh, container registry, that talks to the Kubernetes cluster. How do we do that? Well, again, you can use something like Jenkins. You can use AWS Pipeline. These are tools that manage all the different components. I'm talking about CI, so I'm not gonna go into that full breadth of those products, but we are gonna use something very clever, um, and not a lot of customers uh, you know, take advantage of, and that is CloudWatch Events. CloudWatch Events is a real-time event stream that's in your, your CloudWatch console, and it's a pub sub. So every time something of interest happens in almost any Amazon service and product, it will send a little notification to the CloudWatch event stream. You know, something happened, something happened, something happened. And this event stream can get quite busy, um, but it's real time and it's, it's very accurate. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the CloudWatch event stream to look for code commits. Someone pushed a new code commit. I'm gonna do something. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna kick off a build. Oh, my build is done. Now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take that build artifact, I'm gonna push it to a, a registry. Okay, I did that, now what do I do? I'm gonna kick off my Kubernetes upgrade. So CloudWatch event stream is very, very powerful. I think, my, myself, I don't think a lot of customers use it enough. Uh, very inexpensive and it's there regardless if you use it or not. So might as well use it. I'm gonna use it in our little CI CD pipeline here and I'm gonna create my own pipeline using CloudWatch events. So it's very easy, um, very inexpensive and very, very powerful. And one of the things we're gonna do is the events are gonna look for those commits, and we're gonna fire off um, Lambda functions, and we're gonna update a Slack um, interface, right? Um, who, who uses Slack? I love this. Almost everybody. So Slack, very popular. There are obviously others, uh, Instant Messengers, I'm sure we can integrate with them, but we're gonna integrate it with Slack during the demo, Joe's gonna show it. And uh, you can do really anything. You can also do things like email and, and text messaging or, or whatever you want to do to notify your developer community because you, again, what do you want to have? You want to have that quick feedback loop. You want to notify people what's happening in the build, uh, in the commit, uh, in the deploy. You want your development team to be up to date. All right, so let's get into the particulars of the products. So code commit, uh, Amazon's version of Git. It is compatible. It's a private repository, which is very nice. You don't have to worry about the security as long as you're uh, doing your IAM privileges right. Do remember that Git is a central repository, though, so if you have a large development team, you might have to have um, either users or some sort of cross-account role so they can get into the particular account where the repository is being uh, served up. Backed by S3. Um, how many nines? We all know. How many nines in S3? 11 nines, there is nothing more durable than S3. So your code is not going anywhere. I'm not saying you don't make backups or what have you, but I'm just saying S3 is very, very durable. We don't have to worry about you know, losing a copy or a disk drive failing. So your code's backed by S3, which means we get to inherit all the cool S3 things, including the scalability, right? So if you're doing a small code repository, a 50 meg code repository, or something that's in the gigabytes, it really doesn't matter. You can store anything, anytime. I don't think we'll have time to go into it, but Joseph's told me stories how in the beginning, people would not store code into their, into their code commit repositories. They do it all sorts of things, trying to do a little arbitrage and save a few bucks on, uh, on their storage fees. Because you can put anything into code commit. It doesn't really matter. You can put images and files and all sorts of crazy things. Um, but that, that is uh, not something you do today. You use it for code. 
All right. So, code commit. This is what code commit um, works, or how it works with your developer. On the left side, you see your git commands, things like git clone, git copy, git merge, uh, git add, all, uh, you know, all those cool things you do with git. And on the right, we'll see uh, the code commit service. There's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship. The developer does not have to learn anything new by using code commit. It is, it is compatible. The only thing they have to do is they have to actually create the repository using the AWS CLI or console. Okay, so if, if you haven't logged on to the console in the last couple of days, you might be shocked, right? The whole look and feel is different. Um, I'm still getting used to it myself, uh, but it, it's kind of cool. We've also updated the console for all these tools, these development tools. And one of the nice things that we've done is that code commit, code build, code deploy, and code pipeline are all co-located. You don't have to use all these services, right? But the point is, if you're gonna use one, you might use another one, and now they're all um, within a click of each other. Very easy, you don't have to go hop out of the console and hop back in. So when you click on um, <clears throat> code commit, you go into the code. Uh, you can have a live editor right there. You can edit the files if you wish. Um, you can uh, do things like pull requests and branching and tagging, and we'll talk about that. Um, and you can see on the very bottom, there's a readme uh, in Markdown. And this is very common as well. We also support build badges. It's kind of a simple thing, but people like it. And it is a good visual indicator. Is, is this code good? Did it pass? We do have a visualizer. So one of the nice things about Git is the branch structure. Branches are very lightweight. They're just pointers to um, commit references and hashes. So you can have many, many branches going on, and I'm not gonna talk about the best strategy for that, because that's actually another talk on, unto itself, um, but people generally have multiple branches. They'll have a master branch, they might have a, a fixed branch, they might have a, you know, the, the next, um, uh, next feature branch, things of that nature, and you do need to know how these things are merging back together. So the visualizer is very, very nice. The other thing that's been um, very popular for Git and Git compatible repositories is the ability to do pull requests. So pull requests is almost like a social gathering of developers through the online medium, not through Slack or not through email, but through the, the concept of this pull request. So I want to merge my code back into a branch. Because I'm a junior developer, I have to have the, the senior developers do a code review. And this is forcing a good practice where I just don't get to merge and push my code into the branch, right? I may have done something silly, right? I may have, you know, maybe I don't know exactly what I'm doing or I'm not following best practices. I don't have my comments in the right place. Whatever it might be, a pull request is not an immediate merge. It's a gatekeeper, which allows the senior team uh, to review my code or the project leader. So we do a pull request from one branch into another, and then what happens is we'll, you know, we'll show you, we'll kick off maybe an email, a Slack notification, people say, okay, I got some new code, I get to review it as a senior developer, and then I can improve it. It's been around, I think, for a little over a year, um, but it's been very popular in the Git community, and it's best practice, right? We just don't want people pushing code if, if, uh, if we can avoid it into our branches, and particularly into our production branch, without it being code reviewed. Within the pull request, you have the ability, again, as the senior developer, or even the person who initiated the request, to do comments, you know, what, what's, what is this request for? Um, and then the senior developer can comment on the line of code. Say, like, this is not good code, um, or, you know, you know, this is great code. But the point being is you can go right into the code and, and make comments right there. So we do have notifications, again, part of the feedback loop. So as soon as someone does, for example, a pull request, um, I can, I think at the bottom, have an email sent out to my account saying they're, you know, I'm the senior guy, I get to see the pull requests for whoever the, the reviewers are. Here's an example of the email. It's just a simple trigger. A little nice hot link in there that will take me to the console if I can approve the request or deny it. And that's part of the notification. All right, let's move on to code build. So code build is that managed build service. Um, it works by creating a new environment, you know, a new instance. This instance uh, generally will run in an Amazon service account, so you do not have to manage it. And it exists only for the duration of the build. So if I'm doing multiple builds, I'm creating multiple instances. And each one is clean, and there are no dependencies on the other one. So every time I get that build, I know it's a good build. 
right? I'm not like having some libraries hang around or what have you. And that's an important thing. Continuous scaling, right? I can kick off as many builds as my account allows me. It's 20 as default, but you know, I can always raise that limit and I can have whatever, 50, 100 builds going at the same time. You pay by the minute and um, as soon as the, the build is done, um, the clock stops and you can move on. It's extensible. We're going to show you what, the, what, what this means. Um, it means that you can use, as I mentioned, you can use code build to do things like maintenance. It doesn't have to just build something. It really can do anything that you want to script. And we'll give you an example of that in a minute. A few other features of code build. Uh, webhook support, so if you're not using code commit, but you're using uh, you know, Atlassian, and you're using uh, GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, et cetera, um, they can have webhooks that, that go right into code build. Uh, multiple input repos and outputs on the same build instance. So for example, I don't know, I'm building something that has uh, maybe debug uh, flags or debug features in, in, the, in the output, and then I also have an optimized um, compiled version. That can, that's certainly possible. I mentioned by default it goes into a service account, but you can also have it in your VPC because you want to leverage things in your VPC. I want to push to a cluster that's running in my VPC, so that's an option. You can use environmental variables and also secrets from parameter store, which is a nice thing of the build process. And because every time it's a new build, well, that's great for security and that's great for cleanliness, the fact is I might lose some intermediate artifacts or libraries that I need in my build, so I can use a cache, right now it's S3, um, for speeding things up. So what does code build support out of the box? So both Windows and Linux, and there are many, many standard environments you can see here. Um, now, what if I'm, you know, an Erlang net? I say that because I'm an Erlang net, but what if you're, you know, you're not doing something that's in the standard build? Well, that's why we have Docker in red. If you want to build your own custom environment with your own language or your own runtime, go ahead. As long as it works within a container, you can build your own customized environment. And in fact, for the demo, I did that because I took a standard Golang and I wanted to add it to some Kubernetes uh, tooling so I can push to a Kubernetes cluster. So I just built a little custom environment, it builds my Golang and then pushes to Kubernetes. All right, so this is what the projects look like. You can see that they're the ability to handle multiple source uh, providers there for GitHub, code commit, code pipeline, et cetera. Um, you have the ability to obviously customize the environment. You can do small, medium, large build environments. So here's the, the baseline with three gig of memory, two vCPUs, you can go to four, four CPUs, you can go to eight vCPUs. And it goes a half a cent a minute, one penny a minute, and two cents a minute and also the, the memory scales as well. I believe it goes from uh, three to f five to 16, or three to seven to 16. But the, the memory also scales as you go bigger, obviously. And the bigger machines are typically faster, um, and it, very often it might be better to go bigger, less time, and it's, it's better for everyone. Okay, so I, Chick, excuse me, I choose my, my build environment. You can do the managed ones on the upper left, or again, you can click on my custom ones. So I'm gonna go to Amazon ECR, I'm gonna build my, my own custom um, build environment. So the way the builds work is that there is a Linux or Windows host that um, gets created for you, but then we, we pull down a container which has the build environment in it. So it is using Docker under the hood. Obviously, you get to see how the builds are going. Are they in progress? Are they failed? Are they succeeded? There's all sorts of hyperlinks to go and get more details. Um, obviously, you want to see green. Green is good. But if you do have a problem, um, um, or not a problem, but if you do want to also check out the status, you can go very, very detailed. So you see all the phases on the left? Those are all the things that the, the environment's doing for you. Um, the provisioning is, you can see at 38 seconds is one of the biggest ones. That's creating the machine for you. So we can't, uh, you know, we, we can improve that a little bit. Uh, then we download the source code, we install it, we do pre-build, build, post-build, post and some other things. And if you want to optimize your build, you can go in here and see those different phases. Obviously the logs <coughs> of your build. And the logs are also sent to CloudWatch. On the left is the console, which is kind of cool. You can go right there and just look at it. But you can also go to CloudWatch. Many people use CloudWatch, um, so you have that option. All right, now we get into some of the fun stuff. Uh, 
how do you tell CodeBuild what to do? So there is a YAML file that you should be putting in the top level directory of your source code. You don't actually have to do that. You can hide it um, by having it live on the console. But it's better that you have it in your, in your directory and you can use you know, Git, you can use uh, your source code repository to, uh, to track any changes. We use version two today. It started off with version one. We've moved on to version two. And the lines with the dashes are actually um, shell commands. So you can really write anything you want uh, using shell commands, pretty much. Um, I'm gonna talk about these phases um, in, in some more detail, but you can see in this one, I'm doing a node package manager. I'm installing my libraries, my dependencies, and then I'm doing um, a test. Again, node is not compiled, so we're simply gonna run some tests. These are the phases that you have control over. Install, pre-build, build, and post-build. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. You do not have to use all of them. You can only use build. But if you wanted to do more complicated things, you have these individual phases. And they run in order, so if the install fails, you don't have, obviously try to do the rest. There's some logic there. Here is a more complicated and maybe more realistic build, again, for containers, my container friends out there. In this one, under pre-build, I am logging into the ECR, which is the Elastic Container Registry. All right, I'm using actually an Amazon command there from our CLI. I'm getting a tag, um, which I'm gonna use to tag the container. And then I build it using Docker build, and then in post build, I'm pushing the built container out to the registry. Okay. So th this is only relevant, obviously, if you're using containers, but it's becoming more and more popular, so I just wanted to show you guys an example of this. Clearly, you get to track on how many builds you do, uh, the average time that it takes, et cetera, et cetera. It is good to track you know, what's going on in your environment always. All right, this is a little bit of a switch. This is not code build, this is CloudWatch events. This is the glue that we use to trigger between different, different products. Um, all right, so let's just take a quick look at this. I think this is an important one. Level set, everybody. Okay, so down here, you'll see that it says, and I apologize for those in the back who can't see it, um, but you can see that it's coming from code build. This is a rule that's being fired. As long as the source um, is coming from code build and we're looking at, for example, various build statuses, you know, in progress, succeeded, failed, or stopped. So basically, any kind of build that's happening, um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take that event, and if you can see in the upper right, in this case, we're gonna t copy out um, the output of that event, we're gonna put it into our Slack channel. So this is how I'm using CloudWatch events as my glue, all right? Something happens, okay, I'm gonna trigger an update on my Slack channel. Something happens, I'm gonna you know, push it to the registry. And these are happening whether you have it or not, right? It's real time, so uh, I, as I say, feel free to use it. All right, so the last, I don't know, 20 minutes, we've been talking mostly about Amazon products, uh, how we can use those products to help you in your CI uh, pipeline. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about best practices. Now these best practices um, are somewhat general. You can of course use them uh, on code build and code commit, but you can use them if you're using really any uh, tooling out there, all right? So it's, these are general best practices. And the idea about the best practices are how to use uh, CI to your best effect. All right, you can use CI just to do the build, which is cool, but you can also go faster and faster. All right, so I'm gonna talk about three techniques, maybe a little bit more, and these techniques are nightly checks, branch checks, or pull request checks, and we, when we say check, it, it's really kind of the build process, the, the build and checking of the code. And by the way, I do see some very eager people taking screenshots and things like that with their cameras. Um, I believe that this is gonna be on YouTube and the slides will also be posted on SlideShare. So uh, if you don't get the screenshot, don't, don't worry about it. It'll be all public. All right, so how do we do nightly checks and why do we do nightly checks? Obviously nightly checks done once a night, once a day, however you guys wanna do it. The idea is when the developers come in the morning, they have clean build for them. They have clean code that they can, they can use, they can check out, they can uh, write, their, write their materials on it. Um, we use CloudWatch event schedule. Again, CloudWatch being used, um, again, to leverage it. Event schedule is basically cron. 
If you're not familiar with cloud on bench, it's just a cron job that essentially runs. So we're gonna tell uh, code build to use the build trigger. We create the trigger on the bottom right, and then we tell it you know, when, to, when to fire. I have a daily uh, trigger here, and it's gonna be done at uh, 10 o'clock, 10.05 uh, every day. This gives you some more details on uh, the next few dates it's gonna trigger and what you're doing. Now, again, why do you do this? You want, the you want a clean base for your developers every day, at the very least. However, I think I mentioned in the beginning, one of the cool things is you can use this for that maintenance. Updating tagging, updating, in this case, uh, node packages. So if you guys rely, maybe you have a Ruby website, you know, Ruby on Rails or using Node, there are many, many, many libraries, right? These things are not batteries included. There are just a ton of dependencies out there in real world <coughs> code development. And if those libraries move on, very often your code will break no fault to your own. So one of the nice things about this is that, for example, we can update those libraries once a day. Now, that might still break something, but at least you're not gonna be behind the ball. So how do we do this? Again, each one of those lines is a, uh, is a shell command. So we're gonna delete the old uh, NPM shrink wrap. We're gonna install, install the new libraries. Um, we're gonna test those libraries, make sure it all works. And then we're gonna create a new shrink wrap, which is a, like a node term for, for uh, locking down the libraries. Once we've done that, we're gonna use git within the code build. We're gonna update our repository for us by pushing um, that uh, updated shrink wrap into the repo. So again, we can do pretty much anything because it is just a, a shell, uh, shell commands, um, but this is very common. All right, so we're updating the libraries. We're doing it once a day. Yay, it succeeded. That's all good. And what if it doesn't succeed? Well, we definitely want to be notified, but if we do it in the middle of the night, I'm not watching my Slack channel. So in this case, maybe an e email notification is the right thing to do. And again, we're gonna use CloudWatch events. In the event stream, we're gonna look for failures and times out, and if we do do that, we're gonna use our SNS, our, or email notification, and I can come in in the morning, and I'll see that there is an error. You know, there's something, something failed, and it'll actually give me the error on the test. So what are the good things? Again, clean build, um, maintenance, code maintenance, things of that nature. What are the bad things? It's only done once a day, so if you had made a bug early in the morning, you're not gonna find out until the very next day, until the bill happens. So you do have the ability to block your team up, up to you know, 24 hours before you'll realize it uh, with, a, with a bad push. All right, so how do we do something a little bit better? All right, so now the event stream gets a little bit more complicated. We're going to, um, every time we do a push, uh, to our branch, we're gonna use CloudWatch to kick off a build. So it's not once a day, it's dynamic. This is clearly where you want to be. You want a dynamic build every time you push. Maybe not for every branch, maybe some test branches you don't wanna do it, but for any major branch or testing you wanna do, this is probably where you should be. Again, our CloudWatch event stream, we're looking for, in this case, we're looking for any changes on a particular branch, and I have the master branch set. And let's say I push um, a code, but unlike before where I was, you know, everything was good, I have a failure, I'm gonna get a notification uh, very quickly and I can go in and then I can fix that. Now I have a succeed and everything's good. Now because this is dynamic, I don't wanna use email. I don't wanna rely on email. I wanna do something that's a little bit more up to date, more real time. So this is where I'm gonna use my Slack notification. Again, we're using the event stream to look for things and we're gonna trigger off um, those events. And in this case, we're gonna use a Lambda, which will write that event stream, those results out into the Slack channel. All right, so the, again, we're looking for failures. And this is something, uh, actually we're gonna show you this, Joseph's gonna show this on a, on a modern Slack, but this is the type of thing you'd see, and you're gonna have a hyperlink, you know, there's a failure I can click on, it'll take me right into the console. Again, another way of getting visualization in terms of my code, I can turn on build badges. I think I showed you earlier on. It's a very simple thing, uh, but people love it, and I think it is a good visual indication of what's going on. You know, things are passing or they're failing. So you can go, uh, go into this. And this works for um, GitHub. It doesn't have to be you know, code build um, or code commit. It can be GitHub or GitHub Enterprise. It's just a hyperlink that we give you that will give you the status of your last build. 
and it works in Markdown very nicely. Okay, another way of speeding up my builds, I think I mentioned this earlier, is caching. So we can go into uh, an S3 cache, right, for, in this case, my libraries. Um, if I'm doing multiple builds throughout the day, I don't want to necessarily pull them down from the internet every time. Um, I want to store them locally. Uh, they're not gonna change you know, more than once a day, so I can do that, and I'll just simply use an S3 bucket. I'm gonna go back. This is how you indicate the cache. Uh, I'm gonna say everything in my node modules and all subdirectories are gonna be in the cache. You turn on the caching within the console. Um, and then here's the example. So without the cache, it takes about 12 seconds to pull down all the libraries. I know, 12 seconds, it's not the end of the world but we can improve it. So by going to the cache, it goes down to four seconds. So on a percentage basis, it's a big change. And if I had maybe a large Java executable and Maven and all sorts of things, this could be quite considerable in, in time savings. All right, so branch checks. It's dynamic. Um, you run a build every time. Code is pushed into the branch. Um, you have a feedback loop that's very quick using things like Slack and build badges and the developers know almost immediately. I mean, there is a potential of blocking the team while the build happens and maybe a little bit beyond, but it's definitely where you want to be. However, can we do better? Can we do better? Yes. Thank you very much. We can do better. We can definitely go to the best, the best technique we're gonna talk about. And I just want you all to know that Joe work this morning to change our demo, to put this into our demo. He's like, Nick, we gotta do this. And I was really nervous. This is not the time to muck with the demo, right? All right, well, we're gonna show you this. All right, so pull request checks. Again, a lot more complicated in terms of the logic. I'm not gonna go through it. We have multiple directions happening, uh, all on the CloudWatch event stream. We push, or excuse me, we have a pull request. The pull request is gonna kick off a build the build result is gonna be pushed back into the repository, all right? So why is this key? Because if I'm the senior developer who has to merge and approve this request, I know if it works. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I know if the build actually works and has been tested. So I can get to look at the comments, I get to also look at the build status. So it's, it's very key. So let's just go through this. Uh, the console has changed, so it looks a little bit different, but there's still, you know, create a pull request. Put in your comments what the pull request is, and then you're gonna have an open pull request. You get to see the changes in the code. Uh, and you see that it's open now. And then when you merge it, when you accept the pull request, you have the option of deleting the branch that it came from just to clean things up. And this is generally a best practice as well. Otherwise, you have all these orphan branches you have no idea what to do with. Okay. All right, a few other things. We talked about using S3 as a cache. S3 is known for its scalability. It's not necessarily known for its speed. Can we do something better? Yes, we can. We can use a cache, an in-memory cache, like Redis or Elastic Cache. If we do that, the build time will go down from four seconds to two seconds. Again, I think, what do we start at, 12 seconds? Again, not a huge amount of time, but you can see how we can incrementally knock the time of our builds down, 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 down. So it gets faster and faster. And this, because the cache look, lives in my account, I do have to use the VPC feature. All right. And you can look in the logs that it's talking to the cache, and it's getting all that information out of the cache. A good way of speeding up our builds. Parallel builds. This CloudWatch event stream doesn't have to kick off a single build. All right. If something happens, we can do many things at once. Now, it doesn't always make sense to do many things at once, but if I can do things like aesthetic analysis, um, maybe I can also do things like a security check, or I can do uh, you know, various things. If I can break them out as parallel builds or parallel tests, it's in my benefit to do so. So in this case, we have three parallel builds that are kicked off with a single push, all right? Only if your environment requires it, but if you do, take advantage of it, you know? Amazon scales very well horizontally, Parallelism is a great thing. It really increases your build time um, to where you want it to be. All right, so here we are on the pull request. This is, a, again, sort of our best practices if you wanna make things quick because there is no pushing bad code. I'm a junior developer, I push it, I can break the code base. 
right? But by doing it through the pull request mechanism, it has to be code reviewed and checked, and it reduces the failure rate considerably, all right? No blocking of my team. Now, can I push a request and someone makes a mistake and approves it? Of course, right? There is, again, we're humans. But in terms of automating and checking ourselves, this is, this is really, again, where you want to be. Quite sophisticated um, and, and recommend best practice. But if you don't get here, certainly do the dynamic builds. I love those you know, nightly builds, but really that was like, so last year, let's move on. Let's get to, to the dynamic builds. That's where you want to be. All right, so we're going to move to the demo. Um, let me uh, set this up. Give me a few minutes. Live demo, always a problem. Let's see if this works. Oh, you guys see my screen? All right. So I am at a terminal, and I am going to clone down a repository. Now, this repository, uh, I'm using a git command, git clone. However, that next bit's a little odd, all right? You probably haven't seen that before. Git clone, usually it's a URL. I'm not using that, because what I am using is I am using a helper, a git helper, which integrates very nicely with code commit. So I don't have to write some crazy code commit URL. I can use this helper function. Uh, it's very easy, it's on uh, AWS Labs on GitHub. You can use it, and it makes it much easier to interface with your repositories. The other thing that it does is that it allows me to pull down my repositories using IAM credentials, all right, IAM users. So I don't necessarily have to pull it down as the primary user. I could have created a uh, user that maybe, in my case, I think it's user demo, and user demo has certain privileges associated with it. For example, if I can hit the tab, user demo, wait for the Wi-Fi to refresh, but user demo has the ability to go into my account, but you see the deny, I can't push onto a particular branch, because I'm a junior guy, I don't know what I'm doing. So I can have a team and I can give out the particular uh, user credentials, and I can make sure that to the junior guys, I'm forcing them to do pull requests because they can't push to the, to the master branch. They have no choice. So this is a nice way of leveraging IAM credentials and other aspects of the Amazon platform. All right, so I'm down. I've uh, pulled down my, uh, my code. All right, now this code is a simple Go um, executable, and I have my unit tests. And you'll see, and Joe's gonna show you what the, this, you know, it's a calculator, nothing crazy here. But most of it passed, but division is a problem. Division's broken. So let's go fix it. And the reason division is a problem is that I, I made a mistake. I'm a junior guy, I was all nervous. You know, I, I worked on the calculator really hard, but I, I made a boo-boo. So I put in addition. So let's fix it. Now, what, who can tell me? What, what do I do next? I commit. All right, I got to commit. I made a change. Division, division. All right, after I commit, what do I do? All right, push, I'm all set, right? No, because I don't have permissions, right? This is the example of, now I gotta do a pull request. Oh, God, I, gotta, I got someone has to code review. Ugh. All right, it's okay, it will be okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check out a branch. I'm gonna call it my hotfix branch.
I'm going to push my hotfix branch. And by the way, here's my little, it's busted, right? Because the vision's busted. So let me go up here. I want to create my pull request. And I want to go from hotfix, right? That was the branch I made. So I put, uh, you know, oh, there we go. I put in my comments, you know, uh, my one line summary. I can do great detail. There's a little bit of uh, a markdown I can also do if I want to be really fancy over here. And then it shows me the code changes. I change from addition to sub some division, excuse me. And then I, I finally create my pull request. Now, I can't approve it because, again, I don't have permissions. I have to wait from the senior developer, the product manager, to actually review the code. Um, and, then, and then we can move on. So that's why I have Joseph. Joseph, why don't you come up here? I am a, oh, there we go. <laughs> I am a senior engineer on AWS Code Tools, um, specifically focusing on AWS Code Build. And uh, today I'm doing something I'm quite familiar with in my day-to-day -day job, and that is a pull request. So my colleague Nick here said that he sent me a pull request for the Hello World repository. So we're just gonna go have a look at that real quick and hopefully not contend with the other 50,000 people on the Wi-Fi too much. So we see we have a pull request here for a bug. So we're gonna take a look at that real quick. And over here in the changes, we can take a look at the diff. We can see that changing addition to division is probably something that we should do since this is supposed to be division. So we're gonna go ahead and merge this change. And we'll go ahead and clean up the branch as well so we don't leave that lying around. And I don't know if you actually noticed it, but in the comments down here, we can see that all of the pull request checks succeeded. So like the best practices Nick was talking about, what we actually did is we ran all of the unit tests as soon as the pull request was created. So when I go to look at the pull request, I don't have to make a copy of the code and run the unit test myself or just ship it and hope that they all pass. I have some confidence that they do indeed work. So, we talked a little bit about notifications. So how do we know what's going on with the state of the code? How does the rest of the team get to know about this? So one of the ways we talked about is Slack notifications. So if we go over here to our Slack, we can actually see, well, we can see a lot of things. We can see that we have a build in progress here. So this is the build that was just kicked off by me merging the pull request. And we have a nice link here that we can take and go look at the code build console and see that the build is currently in progress. So while that runs, I'm gonna show you the application itself really quick. It's nothing fancy, it's just a calculator. But we were supposedly fixing division, so let's just double check and see what's going on with division. And yes, it is indeed not doing division. So this is a good fix, it's definitely something we should have shipped. So how else could we have found out that this was in a broken state? Well, we talked about build badges earlier. Um, so this is on the Hello World repository itself. Any member of the team could have gone and looked at the repository and seen that, hey, the tip of master is not building correctly. Something is wrong here. So now that we've merged that pull request, we've started that build, let's go check on the build itself. So what this build is actually doing is we're running all of the unit tests again, and we're packaging up the application into a Docker container. And after we do that, after we create the Docker container, we're going to deploy it out through Kubernetes to our development cluster, which is, which is where our little demo app is currently running. So, and we can see that actually the build is just about completed. Now it's perfect timing. And so now, now that that's completed, we can go back over to Slack and we can see that, oh, we have a new notification telling us that the build is passing, everyone on the team knows it now. Nick knows it if he was watching Slack. And we see a bunch of other stuff here from Kubernetes. And if we go back over to the repository, 
say someone else on the team just wanted to see what was going on with master, we can see that it is now passing. And if we go back over to our little application here, let's just double check that nine divided by nine is indeed one. So that's, that's good, so that means it went out. So again, if you were watching closely, you saw that all I actually had to do here was merge the pull request. I didn't have to really do anything else. All of the automation was done for me. I knew that the test passed before I even merged it, and then it was built and it was deployed out to our development stack all automatically. And with that, I will turn things back over to Nick here. All right, come on, that was a live demo. Come on. <laughs> all right. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are going to say, well, actually, how did you do that to Kubernetes, or, or how did we do the integration? So um, we'll, we can take some questions maybe on the side, but actually what I did was, again, I had a custom environment, so once the build uh, succeeded, we simply did a, a cube cuddle command where we pushed the change out into the, uh, into the cluster, and it happened immediately. That's one of the nice things about Kubernetes. All right, let's just recap, and we're, we're pretty much done, but, so thank you for your time. Automate the boring stuff. Things that you have to do and you can script, please do that. It's part of the DevOps uh, culture and cycle and CI is, is really table stakes for all of it. Use your, your Slack and your, your build badges and other things to do a, a very quick feedback loop for your developers. Build faster if you can, use the caching that I talked about um, and parallel builds. And finally, use unit and integration testing at a, at a base. If you wanna use security testing, other things, that's great, but please do your basic unit tests. Gives you confidence. Um, finally, that is our, our circle here, circle of life. Um, it's very key to really all DevOps processes that incremental changes, um, do things quickly, uh, do them easily. All right, oh, with that, thank you very much. I do appreciate your time.